Oh, here's more people piling in. Let me let me grab one more. Okay, so um, uh, this is Coffee Compiler Club. I'm Cliff Click. Um, there's a couple of people here who haven't been in here in a long time or haven't been before. So this is a standard pre-meeting warm-up message. Um, this is all about compilers and language runtimes and garbage collection and concurrency and locking and code generation and sort of every kind of thing having to do with language implementations. Typing system theory comes around a lot, whether you should love null or hate null. Um, and I record this live. Uh, I put it up uh, on YouTube and Twitter within a couple hours generally, or that's my goal. And sometimes it takes a day. Um, if you don't like being recorded, bail out now and watch it later. Um, otherwise, uh, you know, uh, it's an open mic. I ask you mute if you're not talking, just so we don't get a lot of background noise, but everyone's welcome to ask anything from anybody or say anything they want. And I reserve the right to moderate, never had to do it. And with that, um, you know, we're good to go. Um, and I think Zen was just talking about substring stuff, um, which sounds like you're making progress. And somebody said they wanted to talk about something else about Java and Java or something. I got a morning, uh, a morning tweet message. No, uh, no instant volunteers here. Yes, yes. That's right. It's it's me. Okay, there you go. So I ask. Now's the time. Uh, so give me give me a sec. Give me give, uh, give me just five minutes and I'll be back. Sorry. <laughs> okay, fine. Uh, Zen threw something up here. Okay, this is your substrings. This is the the new version. Yeah, I re I rewrote uh, the document. You can see that uh, I. I, I, I put uh, like a poster child uh, ideal graph, which is relevant for the substring copy things. And, uh, and you can see that there are like three uh, interesting of points, uh, three nodes. Uh, the first one is the allocation node, uh, which allocates like a, a Java string, Java language string object. And uh, the second one is a, a, a allocate a read node which allocated the buffer, the byte buffer of that the first, uh, the first object. The third one is a recopy uh, node. This uh, recopy node uh, copy, copy contents, uh, string co contents from the old string to new string. So if uh, I feel that, uh, you know, in this, in this, uh, in this note, uh, I described that there are some kind of, there are a bunch of interesting properties for those nodes. Um, so for, uh, for example, for example, the, the yeah. array copy node is tightly coupled with, uh, the, the allocation, uh, the, uh, the, 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 the array copy node is tightly coupled with, uh, allocated array node, which means, you know, which means you can, you can, you can assume that, uh, if you modify, uh, they never uh, the, the the constructor of this uh, array copy uh, array array uh, allocated array the constructor of this array and uh, don't have like uh, doesn't have like side effects and the, the other thing is very interesting is I don't know you know or not but um, in current open JDK string class declare stable and declare a annotation called a stable for the for the byte code, uh, by, uh, by, uh, byte buffer, uh, byte buffer value. So, which means after after initialization, we can assume the contents of this buffer never change. That's the second interesting property. Um, okay, slow down here. A um, couple of things here. Um, one is, by the way, I'm following the, the link in the chat. Um, one is the where to go here. Your your graph. You need to ditch the the second line, which is the type, or it greatly compress it just to make the graph like obvious what's going on. Oh, um, it just well, makes the wait graph a minute. To read. What which which line should I remove remove or or uh, uh, get rid uh, of? Hang on, Max. Let me let me let me figure out how to do this here. <laughs> that didn't help any. I don't know how to do this in chat conveniently. So I did it inconveniently. 
Oh, could okay. you give me like an example? Which line should I? No, no, no. It? I'm talking about in the pretty print mm -hmm. of the thing, the second line of every box is hugely long and carries little information that is relevant to understanding the dependencies. Uh -huh. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Just, I should just delete drop them. it, shrink uh -huh. all the boxes, and you get a graph. It'd be a lot easier to understand. The uh, the thing is, uh, you know, the, I I actually I put those the second lines there be, uh, on purpose because you know sometimes I see there's like a static Java call function, but uh, it called the uncommon trap. So that, what what I'm saying is, for a high level overview, if if I'm doing debugging work, you need the second line. So I don't know which which you you don't. That's all. Oh, I see, I see, I see. You're trying to explain. I'm trying to explain to a dozen people what's going on in the graph by indirectly just having you talk about it. And at the same time, I'm looking at it thinking that's a little more complicated than necessary. But that's the shape driven by the giant second line. Um, for, for folks who showed up late, uh -huh. this is yeah. Zen doing uh, optimizations of array copy followed by array copy, or array, array copy followed by array allocate followed by array copy. So the poster child being yeah. you make a string and you just copy the contents. And so basically, you're trying yes. to decide that you've got an array that never has a side effect on it until the second array copy, which then just copies the original array. And can you go back to using the original array? By under what rules or what circumstances yes. can I discover that I have an array copy of a new array and no one can see the first array after the second array copy so I can get rid of the copy and just use the first one directly. And this happens all the time in string optimizations or in string work. So that, that was the, Yes, that, and also you have you have to you have to do that after the escape analysis. I mean the C2 system analysis. I mean, because you know, if you don't uh, you don't know. If this this object the escape or not escape, you cannot assume anything, right? So, but after the escape analysis, I understand that this array never escape from the current method. Then I can safely do the some kind of transformation right. for them. So, so the way I normally do that kind of test is I look at the uses of the pointer that got generated. So the allocate array, sort of in the middle on the right is a node that produces a, a change state of memory, obviously, but a pointer. Um, and I turn around and I follow the uses of the pointer. And if the pointer use goes to somewhere that I don't understand, I claim escaped and I lose. And if it only flows into, like I see the pointer is 366 proj, number five there, goes to some initialize, which is probably I can do compiler knows that intrinsically that's safe. That'll be your zeroing. Goes down to a check cast, which just validates it's not null and should optimize away because it's straight off of an allocate, which never returns a null. In fact, it's declared as raw pointer, not null. So the check cast at 371 should disappear. You have exactly one use of the projection at the array copy. That's your escape analysis. You're done. That's how I would do this operation. Separately, you can have an escape analysis that gets rid of escaping pointers left and right by declaring they don't they don't merge into other alias pointers of the same class and so on and so forth. So you, you can make it an escape analysis is useful in your particular case right here. You don't need escape analysis to do this job in the sense that the graph carries a basic escape analysis all the time. Okay. Did you, Zen, did you catch what I said there? Just look at the uses of I, the allocate array. That pointer doesn't. Yes, have... yes, yes. I see that. Does uh, I didn't saw that. I, I I don't rely on the escapement information because I saw that I I I initially I did that after escape analysis because I feel that I have to get the old information for all Java no Java objects. Because, right. Uh, because uh, but uh, I. Uh, but, but I, I, I not fully I haven't fully understand the the your algorithm <clears throat> to make sure that you know the external external like other threads can observe the correct results for okay so 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 the 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 main hack here the main observation here is that the semantics of the edges are sort of I mean if you don't know what they are we can talk it through go but they are exact and precise. 
um, if an output edge doesn't go anywhere, it, it never mm -hmm. escaped. And, and nothing, nothing oh, this else. Is important. This, is, this is important. If the output never go anywhere, then we can assume that yeah. it never escaped. You, see, yeah, you, you, you have discover all the output this. edges available to you. Okay, so you discover those information from the ideal graph itself it doesn't rely on some kind of Pacific, uh, uh, another graph connection graph to get to discover this information. That's right. Mm -hmm. the, the set of outgoing edges is the entire set of uses. So if it doesn't hit, like if you don't store that pointer in the memory somewhere, yeah. it never escaped. So, exactly. so the, the, what, I, what I'm really trying to get to is you can run this optimization a lot earlier than escape analysis, pre-escape analysis usefully, and mm -hmm. it's useful to do so. In I see that. I see probably that. improves your escape analysis too. Yeah, exactly, exactly. So That's now I understand the, that. The whole C2 theory here is you run everything as early as possible all the time, and there's very few other analyses that have to run as a bulk passover like escape analysis is being done because, um, because everything that feeds early feeds on itself. And so yes. you, if you have to wait until after something, then that something doesn't get the benefit of your optimization and okay. you have a phase ordering problem. And that was the reason the giant iter algorithm works the way it does is it gets rid of a phase ordering problem. This pattern might be a little bit more tricky because uh, we, we have this array, which is the buffer of the string. And we store this array into the string object. The string object may not escape as well, but there would be a store into the string. So we need to analyze the graph essentially. Yeah, right. And so, and so as soon as you, you've got a store into the string header, which in this particular case, I'm looking and I don't see it yet. Um, you have a, uh, maybe I've escaped and maybe I haven't question. And if you do that store anyways, and it's in the graph, but you can reorder it with the array copy, then you know, the problem again goes away. It has not escaped at the time of the array copy. So again, you can fold the copy and the allocate together. So, so I, I do a lot of these kind of games where uh, I can't tell directly because there's a store, as you say, but I can reorder. And as soon as I can reorder, I can reorder and then fold and then you know problem gets, goes away. So essentially use flow sensitive analysis to say, well, at this particular point, there was no escape, so I can do the rewrite thing. Yeah, I don't do it as a flow sensitive. Instead, I do it as a profit test. Perfect. Is there a reason to swap an array copy and a store that appear to be otherwise unrelated except the stores of the array copy? Yeah, if I move the array copy up earlier, maybe I can fold it. So as long as it's monotonic, then I don't do any further analysis than that. Okay, flop these two so that they're not ordered the wrong way and go again. And if I can flop enough things, then the array copy abuts next to the array allocate and I can fold them. I do a lot of that kind of stuff in the graph where you just flop things monotonically in a way that gradually improves without going to the next step of actually doing the job. And without intrinsically saying, I am attempting to do some sort of flow analysis. I just say monotonically, these things make this other transformation obvious, locally correct, locally correct, say obvious, locally correct. And so you just begin flopping graphs. So they do that all the time with like um, every piece of uh, a straight up algebra around array math of adding constants and there's array base and there's index and the index is scaled and added an offset and yada, yada. There's a canonical form the compiler seeks. He doesn't have any brains about it. He just says left and right, one's a constant, one's not. And, you know, flip them accordingly and it folds up all your constant offsets and it folds up all your array shifts in this canonical form. And then all the patterns that look for like induction variables have a trivial pattern to look for. Oh that, yeah, uh, yeah. It sounds like, uh, you know, it's uh, this kind of trick doesn't mean for just a su substream only. So you yeah. are talking about uh, like algebra, algebra situation. I mean, copy, copy right. the array or uh, a matrix array or a matrix and do some kind of rewriting for them. I, uh, I am rewriting the graph in a more canonical form canonical for form. many reasons. Mm -hmm. Sometimes it's- But, but how, how to define canonical form? I, I pick a form. So, in general, you make it up as you go. What, what is the canonical form you want? So the general rule for me is I look for things that cause more optimization. Usually I 
uh, delay stores and hoist loads. Um, an array delay copy. store and hoist the load. <clears throat> yes. So that you have things in registered over longer spans. That's sort of the general rule. It's not 100%. But the, the, the only well, well, rule wait, I wait, wait a second. Wait a second. If you delay stores and uh, hoist the loans, yes, as you said, you, you make the live internal, internal the, uh, the live internal interval, you, let, you, you make the live internal uh, bigger or longer. So which should uh, affect your re result of register allocation, which is bad. So why, why you said okay. you prefer so, this so kind of So that's a different form. problem. So, so I fixed the register allocator first with the goal of it not suffering from having too many live values. So the C2 register allocator will happily live with incredibly excessive count of live ranges. In addition, he'll happily move, you know, scheduling in this light will happily move things around to lower live ranges if it seemed reasonable. What the optimizer, the core optimizer piece, the iter algorithm you're looking at, wants to do is expose parallelism, expose opportunities for other transformations, um, and generally make, uh, 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 I'm gonna say, what's the right way to say here? It's general optimizations in an abstract sense, ignoring register pressure. Okay, yeah. So in, in that guy, he hoists loads and delays stores, but it's all about, I have an infinite count of registers and it's all graph semantics. It's all semantics of the program. So you, you really get caught up. You can't move things typically very far because you get caught up. Yeah, yes. It, so you asked another question, it's actually kind of deep. What is the canonical form? Well, the canonical mm -hmm. form is whatever you want it to be as long as it's monotonic so you don't end up spinning, moving a node left and right and left and right, and left, which totally went through many iterations of that kind of infinite, you know, spinning around a cycle and didn't go anywhere. So you have to figure out what monotonic properties you have and can find and whatever. Um, and there's a bunch of them. And I'll mention the word monotonic floating around in the graph IR comments all the time about, hey, and here I'm flopping left and right. Like if I move a load up because I want it to uh, uh, expose more live range, but I come up to a, um, a region, a, a, a meet point. If I move it up through the meet, I have to clone it. As soon as I clone it, I'm growing the graph, not shrinking. So I refuse to clone it unless I do, and now I do a little more flow sensitive analysis if you like there are there where I'm looking at, I guarantee it will fold away at least as many times as it appears so that it never grows before I'll do that kind of transformation. And then there's one more piece that has to happen, which says I float it up to a back edge around a loop, which means I might spin it forever around the loop body cloning it endlessly. And that amounts to loop peeling endlessly, um, which I have to watch out for, but I, I, it looks like it would spin, but it doesn't because you get blocked by other things until you're ready to spin the control flow through the loop header, which I don't do. I let the loop optimizations do that. So yeah, I'll push loads up through meet points and clone them um, as long as there's fold up opportunities on one branch or the other. Some of the fold ups are, it came against a store that initialized it. Some of them are like, it's just a constant on this one arm. That's actually really common. It's null on this arm and it's not null on that arm. So you push it and you get a null now. I don't know. It's, it's a canonical form. The, the array one's a little different. Certainly at Azul, I did a bunch of stuff getting array uh, allocations and array allocations to try to fold up. And so I did a bunch of canonical work there. My, my graph structure is a little different than yours, but it's not hugely different. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And also, you know, I found that uh, it's not just uh, for string. Uh, uh, yeah. The, uh, the recopy is just not, not, not just for string. You know, there's uh, like another co very common code called uh, object dot clone. Yeah. So it yeah. clones objects, but uh, you know, and uh, in some situation, you just clone an object that as a temporary object and you know try to read some kind of internal status of this object no matter what. So if if I can you know identify certain similar pattern just like I did for the substring copy, probably I can make my case or my optimization more more journal 
more way more journal you mean for all yeah. objects that sounds like more interesting but yeah. you know yeah. i'm i'm just a beginner i'm try to you know finish up the one thing and you know let's see how it works and move on move, move on the next one yeah that's my plan i i i'm with you that it, this should be a very general optimization and the fact that it's strings or arrays of cars is sort of not interesting per se. So long as the arrays are compatible, you should build collapse array copy and array copy. Mm -hmm. there's, uh, there's a I lot of a variations question. on the same theme there, like string builders, all this kind of stuff. A question to Zin about the about the graph. Uh, so do I understand correctly that the, the graph is for the first example where uh, there is a search width of a uh, substring? Yes. But if, if it's a... Mm -hmm. so, yes, it is. It's a uh, you know Cliff says that I should post like a poster child. That's that's it's like a, a actually this is sub this this graph is from the first example. You can see the first example full, and uh, you create a, a substring. Uh, exam did, did you see the, the 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 example one the first example? You create a substring from the base string and do and invoke the starts with. So basically, it's a read only. A uh, read-only case for the substring. So that's uh, I I I I posted this uh, graph from this uh, from this this example. Does the graph include the starts with as well? No. Okay. Looking because... at the graph, as a start yeah. of the program. No, it's it doesn't include uh, the starts yeah, with. It I, the starts with. Yeah, mm -hmm. I I just I just want to show show the. The the example uh, the the, the subgraph about the substring part and um, so uh, you know because you know when you do some kind of optimization uh, you have to identify a pattern first so that that's a cliff told me to do and uh, so I I try to describe look look at this graph the, there's some kind of certain pattern here so for example there are like three nodes like I described uh, um, before and there are like three nodes so what's the relationship among those three nodes so I try to describe that from this graph and uh, you know I I I I wrote the code to 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 model the similar pattern uh, in the in the a recopy is ideal function. So, and uh, after I identify this pattern, then I can do something. I can do some rewiring things for this case. That's what I'm doing right now. Yeah, so I, w what I was getting at is, uh, if, you, if you look at the starts with code, mm -hmm. essentially there would be one load, uh, either it will be in a loop or if, uh, if it's mm -hmm. one character and profile kicked in, there would be a load. But essentially you have a load from the uh, newly allocated array and yes. essentially what you want to do is instead of doing a load from the newly allocated array, you want to forward this load to the, uh, to the original uh, string, which was passed, probably uh, changing the offset. And then, yes. right, uh, and then kill the allocated array. Yeah, yeah. yeah. After, after that, there are no uses of the new allocation. And, so so yeah. both, both of the approaches are semantically equivalent in the end. And if you're looking for... This is me doing my canonical graph shape. If I do a church roster one step property, both should be implemented and then you can go either way. And one of them says you fold the array copy up under the array initialize and say I have a, the initial array that's with a shifted offsets that are carried forward. And the other one is I push the load up through the array copy because I recognize I can just offset it through the prior array. And then, uh, and then the array copy goes dead and can be removed. And in either case, you get rid of the array copy, but you go about it by, you have two sides of the square and you push the load up through the array and the array goes away, or you push the array up into the allocate and, and then that it goes away that way. Although, um, both of those properties, both those tests work. And in general, in C2, I usually canonically force the graph such that one, that, that if it's the other shape, it goes to the one or I end up doing them both. So I don't care what order I visit them either order it'll collapse. So I understand how if we rewrite the load, there would be no uses of the allocation, we can right. eliminate it. But uh, the alternative one, can you, can you elaborate? Yeah, right. So, so I have an array copy of an allocated array and I validate that the pointers aren't escaping and there's no uses of the, of the there's no writes into the allocated one, which is typical after a new string operation. 
So then the array copy can refer to the original array with different offsets. So I want to take the pointer to the array copied version as if it were a new thing and say this pointer, all uses of it have to have their offsets modified and then the pointer points to the original. Uh, wait, I, I thought on the example nice. we we're looking at. Cameron. Cameron's getting his, his, yeah, it is a typecast. It's casting the shape of your arm to the proper shape it should be. <laughs> okay. Um, I, I, sorry, go I, ahead. That the example we are looking at, uh, that we have the string which, which comes as a parameter, then we have a new allocation for the, for the new buffer, and right. then we have a recopy from the external array. So in this case, there is no uh, forwarding through, through a chain of arrays. There is only one array copy from some external buffer. Yeah, if you have just the one, then, then you don't have an allocate. His, his example says I substringed it, which gives me an array copy, but the, the graph shape says I made a new array, which I don't see in example one. Well, the, the new array is the substring. Uh, it, it will create a new string. It will copy the content of the- uh, Oh, then your allocate array and your al array copy are not, are not what I was thinking they were, which is fine. Okay, you're saying allocate array is just making a, 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 an empty space and not actually initializing it from anything, which is, okay, fine. Yeah, sure. Then you have to do, move the load through. Yeah, there's a, some kind of there's a, like a very smart optimization in C2. So oh. if 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 C2 uh if C2 identify that this array copy is tightly coupled with a allocate allocate array, so they know that you know I don't need to initialize or I don't need to zero zero the you don't array. Need to zero so, it, yeah, yeah, I yeah because you you will you instantly copy the contents to fill in fill in with the contents, you know. Right, so right. I skip the some kind of initial uh, zero zero in things for this original array in the instructor in right. the constructor. So I feel that is very interesting, and uh, you know that it's called a tightly coupled. I I didn't do some kind of. Uh, I didn't go look, uh, look back the code to figure out who wrote that, but I feel that this is very interesting optimization. Pretty right. Pretty smart. Yeah. So, so, but Arthur's right then. You need to take the load and peek it through an array, allocate uh, array copy and shift the offset and load from the original, which you can do if you can val validate there was no, uh, no storage in between the two. Yeah, the, the analysis you need for that is very similar to the one where you forward through array copies through a chain of arrays. But what you yeah. do is, yeah, you replace the, the load, the, the, the source of the load. Yeah. Like an array yeah. copy is a giant store. And, and I, I forward loads through stores all the time. You just uh, when, when, you say, when you say you forward the load yeah. all the time, so you, you mean in C2 or in the other compilers? I, I meant in C2, but from 20 years ago, and prior compilers, and hence compilers. If you can see a load bypasses a store, you bypass it. Um, you have to do the, the minimal, it's the wrong, you know, it doesn't, you have the, you have the, the, the exact alias classing. And if it's not of the right alias class, it bypasses for free. Um, in the case of a rate copy, you have to do the, the offset math. Don't yeah, but- even. No, you should just be able to bypass through. Yeah, but the thing is, yeah. you know, in C2, because you create another array, you create another array or buffer, right? So the alien analysis has no idea about this array is the same as all, all the array. So they cannot tell you that you don't need to load from this new, old, new array. You, you can forward to load from the older array. And you know, C2 is okay. not a, that smart. Okay, okay. So, so we have to hang on. Uh, so I'm remembering what I did at, Azul, which is not necessarily where C2 is at at Oracle, but there's definitely a case where you bring up a load against uh, uh, an array copy and you have to do the, the, the base escape says no, they overlap because they're both, you're loading from an array of, of car and you've got an array copy of car, so fine. But then the next thing is, is you look at the pointer fields 
um, because the, the communicates that the allocated array, the array copy comes straight up from a fresh allocation. And then the load is either going to be from that fresh allocation or from some prior thing and the fresh allocation escaped or didn't. And these are all sort of constant time local graph questions. Yes. And if there's no escape from the uh, uh, fresh allocation and the load does not directly point to it, then then they don't out, they don't they don't alias and you can totally bypass as unrelated. Yes. And, and and otherwise, also, you can ask the, the other question is, are they exactly aliased? The loads from the ba array base, the array copies of the array base. Then you do like a load store bypass. The load becomes the value you got stored. Yeah. Uh, yes, I have to say that according my knowledge of C2 so far, I don't think C2 has similar optimization uh, right now. So which sounds very interesting. And the other thing is- Okay, so I'm certain I did some of this stuff at, at Sun. Like and this stuff floats around. It, I don't know, like, I don't know where they're at right now, but I know it floats around. And also I have to say that uh, it means a lot because you know, not just you, you not just you forward a uh, uh, forward a load from the new 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 objects to the old objects. It means you can skip a, a barrier. You can skip a barrier. It means a lot because you know after you store something to a field, you have to emit like a, a red barrier. So to make sure that other process other threads can see them. Oh, well, slow but, down, slow down. You're talking about memory model uh, uh yeah memory model semantics are you talking about gc gc barrier i mean you, i mean you can skip a gc barrier if you if you if you don't need to okay yeah yeah slow store down a field. no you, you don't so so gc barriers are only safe points safe points have a semantics that you're not bypassing a safe point so i didn't say bypass a safe point so if you're not bypassing a safe point there's no gc barrier if you're talking about memory models, there'll be a, a memory barrier in the graph, and you're not bypassing that without a whole lot of care. So I'm talking about there's no safe point in the graph, so there's no GC things going around, so you, there's nothing to bypass. There's no memory barriers in the graph, so there's no volatile issues, no locking issues you have to bypass. No, 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 no. Go back to the GC barrier. Uh -huh. What I observe is that for the allocator re object node, Right, that that second node, uh, allocate a re node for the strings buffer, and uh, I found that uh, it is it is uh, object uh, object right, and uh, its escapement information is argument inform argument escape, not like no escape. Even in this uh, pretty dummy function, it's not uh, like no escape. You mean the allocate array or the, yes. the allocate at the top for the string object? Yes. The yeah. reason is uh, the reason is the funny thing is uh, the I actually I, after I debug this one I found that uh, actually es escape analysis is correct so this reference or this pointer does escape to a pre-read barrier of G G1 GC so it sounds <laughs> okay so so I um I mean I don't know what people did with their graph semantics an allocate will have for me an allocate was always uh. Uh, a test with a safe point on one side and a magical new memory showed up pointer on the other and a, and a memory state and a pointer to the memory. And you couldn't bypass the safe point um, with anything that had language changing semantics because it blew your as if rule if you took the safe point, right? The safe point triggered you, you were in the wrong place. But I would put the safe points directly in the graph. So mm -hmm. now there's an allocate node. Does it include the safe point in it? If the allocate can ever fail, then it, it, in theory, it has to have a safe point in it. So it has a safe point in it, you can't bat, bypass the allocate. But I, I like I said, I, I optimized that version by having the safe points be explicit, and then you could go as far as you could go, as long as you could honor the semantics of the safe point, which maybe you bypass loads and stores left and right on the main path, but the safe point path could reconstruct a valid state of memory for that particular safe point. Um, even expensively by undoing whatever you're trying to do. Okay. So I, this, yeah. this, this is not my graph shape. This is whatever you guys are, you guys or Oracle's been doing. Um, I would propose the good graph shape is some sort of test where all safe points are explicit and they're also baked in profiles that said they're horribly low frequency. 
No, 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 no. For, first of all, I have to say that the current situation is more subtle than like, um, like a, a decade years ago. So for example, for G1, GC, there's like a concurrent marking phase, right? Yeah. So, so it's not necessary. Uh, when I say like GC Barry, it's not, it, it doesn't mean like uh, the, like a very, very, the, those GC, G, uh, those save points. I mean that, you know, in some certain points, a certain bad code like a put a field or a put a field, you have to emit, you, you have to emit a, a, a GC pre-write barrier to right. let, to let uh, the concurrent uh, concurrent marker know that uh, okay currently some bar, some guy store some field some some value to um, to a field of uh, objects so when i zool's collector has been incrementally marking for decades you know a decade so this happens all the time okay yeah yeah, yeah, I, I know that. So let, let me let me review the situation. I, I, I want to I just want to say that if you successfully skip skip uh, load objects uh, load value from the newly allocated uh, objects, you probably can skip like a pre write barrier pre write uh, pre write barrier. If there's, if, if there's if there should be no read or write barriers for GC in this particular graph at this stage. And if there's no read and write barriers, there's nothing to worry about skipping. The read and write barriers come in later. First, you carry the semantics around. So the safe points have the right semantics. And then if you need to have read barriers or write barriers, I mean, for right me, barrier. For Azul, in, in this situation, I, I observe a write barrier. Yeah, they, they get added very late in life. You don't need a write barrier. If I have, so you're saying I need a barrier for stores and I can't bypass. If I have a store, back-to-back -back stores in a row of to the same place of five different things, I can collapse them all and store the last one. And the GC can't ever tell. He has no clue. So the GC is is unaffected, cannot be affected by this. I, I, I might. be wrong binding is oh, you they write a barrier for all stores so and yeah. try to get rid of them as soon uh, as as many as possible okay later then then you you cut out for about 20 seconds on my mic on my end oh so okay let me let, let, I, I, I might be wrong i just i, I just said that i might be wrong but uh, i feel that the c2 uh, currently currently open jdk has about uh, you need uh, like a, a right barriers for all those stores right. and then try to when, get rid of them. When, when do they emit them? Uh, you know, when they when in parser, in parser, they pass some kind of oh, in the field. parser, they're emitting right barriers. Yeah. Oh, God. That okay, strange. that's a mistake. Fine. But but All they right. try to they try to get rid of them. Uh, yeah 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 yeah. How, uh, you know, but you later. shouldn't be emitting write barriers in the parser. This is a GC effect. It should be emitted way late in life. Fine. Yeah yeah. As soon as you did that, you shot yourself in the foot big time. I, I might know. be wrong. I might be wrong because I'm still reading the source code and try to understand this situation. But I found. But in my in this situation, this is a poster child, I observe a pre-write barrier, and for the array it's not allocated your, it's array not showing in your graph. Yeah, I, I delete them. I delete them uh, because it's pretty big. The, the graph is pretty big, so I delete yeah, them. Yeah, right. Well, make sure that loaded your write barriers already. Yeah, sure. I I would claim the correct answer is write barriers go. Um, Basically, after after pre pre code gen and after you've done all the core optimizations, I would allow the scheduler to take advantage of them. I would allow the standard optimizer to take advantage. I would not allow them to confuse the standard optimization. So I wouldn't insert them until sort of very late in the still ideal graph form. Um, and then once I've declared I'm inserting them, I know that my standard core optimizations are now wedged and won't make any more progress. Like th they're all valid and correct. They just will fail to make any progress. And then the right barriers can do what the right barriers do and the optimizer, which will mostly explode the common parts away and hoist invariants and the like. Um, and then you flow that into, you know, code gen and register allocation.
Yeah, because you know, I I kind of agree. And the thing is, those pre write those write barriers are function call, which which will be treated like a black box for those for compilers. So so if you insert them too early, then the compiler became very conservative because it has no idea about those function calls. So, yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. So don't do it. <laughs> Sorry, I'm not talking to the right person. Yeah, fine. You know, you know, people can shoot themselves in the foot all they want. I, I, I can't stop them. <laughs> no one on the JDK asked me. Open JDK asked me where to do it there. I'd have told them don't do it there, but fine. I, know I had problems in the past with people outside the compiler group doing major compiler hacks that would break everything in terms of optimization. We have to go unwind. Back when back at Sun, even it was happening. So. Now you have a harder problem, Zen, and I would propose the the a, a better answer is to try and get connection with the right people in the Open JDK, and I don't know who those are, and me, and see if they're interested in having conversation about performance on Open JDK. If they're if they are, we can go down the path of okay, what are you guys doing here, and why, and see if there's something you know to be done there that might make life better for everybody. Otherwise, yeah, you have a harder problem. And I don't know what the extent of your problem is, but as soon as you got write barriers in at that stage of the game, all graph pattern things get wedged. Uh, oh, the I thing is, it's not that bad because, uh, you know, after I do the transformation, I delete the uh, allocated array and I delete the array copy. So so those kind of barrier also goes away with them. So, so I think right. I, I, you, to, you have to match through all the barriers. The barriers are in the middle of the match. Yes. Yeah, yeah, that's what I'm saying. Yes. Like how many thousand matches are there in the system? Okay, every last one of them has to have like, and if I see a barrier, skip it. And I think that's the that's the insane part I'm saying, don't do. Okay. It's fine. Although it might be the point at which Zin is looking at the uh, at the graph in the pipeline. If you are looking late in the pipeline, it's possible that you already have the barriers. Uh, like I would double check this aspect because I agree that sounds strange. And if you like, if you look early in the pipeline, maybe, maybe it's just not there. What, what I'm what I'm saying is, the pipeline should be arranged such that the barriers show up after anything Zin's trying to do. And what I heard Zin say is the barriers show up at parse time, which means you're carrying them through everything. Every optimization sees barriers, and that's the part that makes no sense to me. So I, I, yeah. I think granted on this like plenty. I, let's let's set it aside. It's like it's encouraging you're making progress here. Um, but you know, I discovered something new about OpenJDK today. Fine. Um, I don't know, you want to say anything else in here before we close off? Yeah, that's all. I, I, I really appreciate your your guys' help. So I let go back to finish the, these kind of things. And uh, if I got some progress, I will report later. <laughs> okay, yeah. Um, and then I guess, uh, oh yeah, and the other thing I guess, Zen, is you said you were doing escape and doing it after EA, and maybe that you can move yourself earlier. If yeah, yeah, yes, I will consider that. I hear that. I hear you. I, I feel okay. that it's quite inspiring, you know, uh, because if, if I can discover this information uh, from the ideal graph itself, then I don't need to rely on the uh, EA, so that yeah. sounds terrific, yeah. Yeah. Well, I was also wondering if if the barriers weren't in fact put in a parse, but were put in at some point. If you got early enough, you might be able to get ahead of where they get inserted. But I don't know. If they come in at parse, it's going to be hard to beat. It's fine. Um, Alfonso, you were going to say something at some point. Yes. Right. So um, we just three days ago we released uh, a JVM written in Java. So, and it's entirely written in Java, and it's a normal Java application that uh, you can run on a normal uh, vanilla OpenJDK. Uh, but if you run it on GraalVM, then you get uh, the you know, partial evaluation and compilation and all the fancy stuff. Um, so, and the question, so there are many questions of like, like why, right? And then, uh, yeah, but uh, who, who, who wrote the GC? Where's the GC? Or uh, where's the compiler? All, all, the, all this kind of stuff. And... Uh, so basically, uh, we use the host VM GC. So uh, since we, so, and then you can, so, sorry. That, we use the GC for the host VM. Use what for the host VM? The, the GC, sorry, GC for, from the host VM. Okay. And so 
you can see it as if you are writing a, a JVM on C++, then you will use the C++ memory mechanism to do it. But if you're writing it on Java, then you will use it. You will use the, the, the Java way of doing it, right? So um, you can compile this program uh, with, uh, uh, with an, as a native image. So basically you can uh, write, like get a, an AOT version of the, of the VM and then you don't need hotspot. Um, but so I mean, like hotspot is, is good because then you can debug your VM as a normal Java app. And then we have this this tricky setup where you uh, connect to the debugger on the on the VM level and then connect to the debugger on the guest level. So you can debug two two VMs at the same time. So, I mean, it's so back up. So you're saying you have a self hosting Java in yes, Java self hosting. Yes, it can it can and it can run itself. Yes, and okay. several layers deep. It's just like you can. Yeah. We get a little standard self-hosting. Yes, yes. So no uh, bootstrap step, nothing. It's just normal Java and it works. Okay, but wait, where's your garbage collection come from in there under the... Well, if you build the self-hosted VM... Can, I'm sorry, can you build a standalone image? That's, that was the question. How do you... Um, your what, what do you mean by standalone? I, yes, I'm sorry, so... Wrong question for me. If you... Um, if, can you build a standalone image? Yes, so you can build a native image for the for the VM, and oh. then you will use the the GC provided by Substrate VM, which is the the yeah the so native. If you build a uh, native image, you you you've got no Substrate VM. You've got you, raw image. No, but what we do, so we, we use this this uh with Substrate VM from from Graal to to build native images, and then you oh. or you compile it, and then you use the GC bundle with it, right? That's that's okay. the trick. Right. Okay. And so in that. Standalone VM, the compiler is the Graal compiler. Is that the JIT? The correct, Graal? correct. Okay. Yes. And GC is whatever Graal folded in, which is what? Um, so now we have a, a very simple copying uh, GC. Okay. Uh, but there's a G1, uh, a G1 port on the enterprise version. And yeah, you just basically whatever is in the host. Okay. And the compiler is not Graal directly because it's, it doesn't, it's not as fast as Graal. Is 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 uh, so basically you write an interpreter, and via partial evaluation you get the compiler. So technically it's Graal, and okay. yeah, I've seen partial evaluations not... done with interpretation a lot, and they always suck compared to a real compiler. It's fine. Yeah, maybe. So let's say like that in an ideal world, um, the compiled code should be pretty close to the to the yeah, original yeah. code. But, that, that's but in, in reality, that's not right. quite the case. That's been the case. In the ideal world, it should be the same. I've heard that same story for 20 years, 20 years. So I'm not claiming you know, that you can't solve a problem. I'm saying that it's been a long time, and I have yet to see it solved by anybody. So more power to you. But the fact that you have a standalone VM basically written in Java, but you can make a standalone image is is impressive that that's nice yes uh, um, i'm kind of curious there what the uh, problem were you trying to solve by making the entire jvm self-hosted because with with compilers i fully understand it right you want you want to uh, yeah. sort of continue development etc uh what was your problem basically right so in, in graal vm we have the, we have this framework truffle where you can implement languages on top so we have ruby python javascript uh, an LLVM uh, interpreter, uh, Bitcode. Um, so the idea was to to put Java on the same level because then you have Java on the host level and all these languages on top, but then it, Java will always be uh, like a, a lower level citizen. So with this VM, then now Java can run at the same level as the other languages. And then the second thing is that uh, prototyping in this time, it's a very simple VM, it's basically just an interpreter with a bunch of, I mean, we have GNI, we have the VM implementation, we have all, all the things to make it a real VM. Um, but it's actually very simple to to change things or prototype or on. And the other thing is this, you can also um, have a sandbox. So let's say like um, Hotspot is, is very invasive. Uh, it wants to place the, the, the OS, right? It wants to hook all the signals, you want to do crazy stuff in your, in your process and for example, you, you cannot run two, two, two VMs in the same process. It just, it, it's not possible. But with, with this new tiny VM, it, it doesn't do any crazy thing. It just, it, it works. It, it, you, you can actually have several um, VMs running in the same process, isolated run from each other. 
th those invasive interrupt catching things are all like big yes. performance games. I, I agree. I agree. And we could do the same. We could do the same. Basically, we could uh, do all these kind of tricks, right? But uh, as an optional thing, so oh, it's, it's not needed. Sorry. My antique cat wanted to go outside until he realized it was raining. And he wanted to come inside and get everyone wet. Then he wanted to meow for the door to go back outside. And my wife was trying to chase him off. It's unnecessary. It's all good. Ah, so so you have a yeah, fine. Okay. Yeah, I'm with York. I'm a little bit like, ah, you know, motivation. Okay, fine. It's, it's a it's a question, but it's kind of cool that it's finally happening. I don't know. I've watched the crawl guys try to get a standalone VM for a long time. Yes. Um, and the other thing is that we we is like a uh, host pod express, which is I think dead somehow. In the sense that we can run eight or eleven, and most likely seventeen, uh, using the same code base. So it's, it's it's a single VM that can run any version. It's a bunch of ifs here and there, but most of most most of the, most of the things are shared, and yeah, that's it. That's the the Java and Truffle thing. I mean, it's just a very cool from the research perspective. We had a guy yeah, here two weeks ago who was doing a JVM in Rust. And I wish he was here today. I say it was Aaron. I think he he couldn't make it, which sucks. Be good. Fine, some other time. Yeah. Well, it'll be interesting to see where you guys take it from there. Is your, your kind of goal to to have it just play like raw as a backend for you know use of Python and and you know, JavaScript and whoever and Java, or are you you're trying to get it as performant as Hotspot to have a, a alternative have a replacement? I'm, I'm like, what, what's the long-term goal here? Well, it, it's very open for now, but um, the idea is so to get to as close as as, as possible as uh, possible, but offer more features. For example, we have all these fancy class redefinition uh, on runtime like modifications you can do to the VM, and we can do it very easily. Uh, that hospitals cannot do. Um, um, the, the the thing is that you people we we are. Uh, can, can afford to pay, I don't know, like 20%, maybe 2x, uh, in order to have those features for development. So you don't have to restart your, your application every time, all this kind of stuff. Um, the other things is that it's a tiny, tiny VM, simpler VM. So anybody can just come in and try stuff, prototype things. I think that's, that's another additional. Yeah, uh, Hotspot has agglomerated. It was it was very tiny a very long time ago, and uh, and did very cool stuff in a small space. But it has accreted a lot. It's fine. It's been a long time due for a, a complete overhaul, which whatever redo from scratch or not. It's fine. I, I'm curious. Oh. You say that uh, you say that in ideal world the performance should be as good as if it uh, was compiled by Graal. But uh, in practice, it's not, and that's what I read in um, in the article or release notes. Uh, what are the, like, the the issues in terms of performance you see, uh, and like what oh. kind of problems you observe? Can, can you throw a link in under the chat, and then yeah, answer. I mean, sorry, don't interrupt. Well, I, I'll just do it in, on, in the same time. Um, for the, the problem is that the partial evaluation, so or instance of implementation. It's not the same as the Graal or Hotspot instances. So literally, we have to implement instance of in Java, right? And and all these kind of operations, we, we cannot directly map to because it's an instance of on a different. I mean, we have our own classes, methods, fields. Basically, we model everything in the VM on, on in Java. So it's very hard for partial evaluation to to understand. Oh, this is the, the properties of, of the operations itself, right? In in, in Graal or Hotspot. It, it's very um, 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 tuned for, for all these operations in work virtual. So all the, the optimizations are really hard coded, very deep in the compilers. But through partial evaluation, you have to teach the, the partial evaluator to actually 
hey, by the way, you can follow this, this, this check, you can do this, you can do that. And that's the hard part. And for example, we, we, we barely have any profiles at the moment. So when you compile a method, you literally compile, compile all the branches and, and it's, it's, it's just horrible, right? Um, and and things, things like this. Um, the other thing, yeah, I think that most, that's the, the hard part. And the this, other cool stuff. This, by the way, um, is what you just said is generally true, ha has been generally true for, the, for, like I said, for 20 years at least, where the partial evaluator doesn't understand the, the deep language semantics that the compiler gets told directly what it is. And, and that's sort of the general interpreter doesn't get to understand the deep semantics. And so it doesn't get to do all the things the compiler does, and that's your that's your optimization. But but you but you can teach your 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 um, your partial evaluator to three to see through all these these this, I mean like it's hard work, right? You, you well, literally need to re rewrite when right and all and the, the, the wisdom act, from the compiler. Right. And the act of doing that is all the effort that goes into a compiler. So as I'm saying, it's, it's, it, it didn't save you anything in the end because that's what you end up teaching the compiler as well. Except the compiler gets the advantage of having an IR and a description that's sort of more well-tuned to understanding large chunks of program and manipulating it. Whereas the partial evaluator has to always start from like the interpreter state every time. Can you throw a link in the chat? Is there, do you have a link? Yeah. Thank you. That link, I, I, it points to the article, which is not quite merged yet. Isn't isn't GitHub, but it's not in the master branch yet. We're currently merging it. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah, that's an interesting yeah. trade off. On, on the one hand, with partial evaluation, you have the compiler almost for free when you have the interpreter, but then if you want to to have performance if you want to teach you some yeah. some like knowledge about your primitives then like you need to do extra work yeah yeah so i think you can do really crazy things with the with the partial evaluator so at some point there was this experiment where you could have like a automatic valhalla so basically you could have your collections and uh, with some pro profiles um, actually use the primitive so like use primitive arrays so all these kind of crazy things you can do uh, with, with Truffle, actually, where you, you can um, um, go beyond just the, the normal things you can do. You can profile for more um, high-level things, let's say. Anyway, so the, the, the Valhalla thing is not working on Espresso. It wasn't on the previous uh, version of the project. Yeah. Although, how, how does this thing with... Um, with automatic Valhalla works. Uh, is it because you 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 profile collection that, okay, this collection will only hold primitive yes. types and then you exactly. specialize for the primitive type. Okay. Correct. Yep. Cool. That's it. Yeah, I'm playing around with that kind of stuff with AA right now, doing the auto specialization for primitives. <laughs> Although, wait, how, how does this work? Okay, I, I can I can understand how we can specialize uh, compiled code, but then what if we pass around this object, which um, which internal representation is not what other parts of the system expect? In like, in what I'm doing, I I clone up to some particular point and declare the clone specialized copies, however deep. And then after that, uh, there has to be a runtime test on the entire collection. Uh, you mean when you pass it around, there's a runtime check which verifies that the receiver can accept this representation? Um, yeah, more or less. The, the receiver decides that he is uh, he's intended to be a specialized version or not. So if he's just going to pass it around as a generic thing, because it's just being pointer being passed around, he just passes it around, doesn't care, there's no check. If it comes to receiver that says, and here I'm going to uh, walk through the elements of the array and compute a square root, then it better be a float array, for instance. Um, and so at that point, he'll do the runtime check and then declare he's, um, I'm calling the float array specialized version and away I go. 
Oh, that's a bad example. There's got to be a better example here. Um, like the, the I, I'm not handling, I specifically am not handling the cases where the array contains uh, uh, various different kinds of things. So it's either all floats or all strings or all this is or all that's. And if you have to have different stuff, like you're jamming capital I integer and little integer or floats or whatever, then it's auto boxing. And I'll, I'll make you say that you love auto boxing or not. Like, like there's a thing you can do to say auto box or don't. Um, but if you're doing the default, I want to be fast, then I'll validate that you're always a, some primitive type and I'll make the thing of a primitive type and I'll cast it as a, the typing system will acknowledge it's a primitive type and then flow the primitive type around and then make cutoff points where he agrees he's being mixed with other things and he doesn't know what class they are. So he'll forget that he's a primitive. And then those might get handed off to specialized versions of, of code, which know how to handle that primitive well, in which case they'll check for that at that point, or they'll fork off to another version that handles the kind of primitive you have. So this is only for homogenous collections. Um, what if it is passed somewhere which does not have the specialized implementation? Does it get like inflated to, uh, to, to the, uh, although I, I, I assume the, the Java model where it's. Um, yeah, I'm not, I'm not. But well, probably it's different. Right, I'm not, I'm not necessarily the Java model here. So for me, I will, I will validate that every location has the correct type and specialize accordingly to make all the specialized copies uh, available. Um, so it won't ever get past a spot which can't handle it. It'll either say, I can handle the generic thing or uh, do I have a link for it? No, I don't have any documentation. Um, other than you go on GitHub and you look and then buried in the core guts of function node dot, you know, Java, there is a thing that says, hey, I want to type specialize here. <laughs> That's not really documentation though. Um, Ah, I lost my train of thought. Yeah, you, you don't, you, you, I, 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 your program's not type correct if there's a chance of you passing a specialized array to a piece of code which can't handle that specialization. So at that point, I'll either uh, uh, clone a specialized version on the spot as part of type checking, or I'll declare that you have to proclaim that you're going to auto box. Like suppose I want to make a hash table implementation <clears throat> that just does keys and values, but then I want a specialized version of a hash table where the keys are, are raw ints, right? Versus a version where the, you know, the hash table has a standard object that understands the hash function, um, like string would. Then the, the specialized version of hash table, the, the generic hash table call would have to break out to the different versions if I can't. And I try to inline that to where it doesn't happen very often. That's a performance, not a typing thing. If, um, if I need a copy that's specialized though, I'll make a specialized hash table that says I have integer raw integer keys. So does that answer your question? Yeah, more or less. Uh, although, uh, what about the, um, the the Java thing, which uh, Alfonso was talking about? Like it, it's it, it should be similar, but it I think it's more complicated because it needs to it probably have a runtime inflation of, um, of yeah. primitive collections to to generic. I, I voted that I shall not auto inflate primitives to generic, <clears throat> but you can ask for it. But you say so with a type annotation saying, and here, uh, you know, I'll eat a specialized thing and pay the cost because that cost can be really high. So I, I demand the programmer annotate the program. It looks like there's a there's a link to the paper in the chat. Is that the the one in question here? Well, that, that's an old version. So, for isn't also Truffle on, on a, for, from a previous version of the project. So, actually, that version was like scratched up, and there's a new completely rewrite of the whole Truffle and Java thing. But that was one of the things they could make make already in the previous version. This is like a high level overview of Truffle. Are you actually? It, it, from the early days, right? It's, this paper is 
217 or something like that. Yes, I would claim that's not early days for Truffle. <laughs> Truffle's been around longer than that. Uh, it's better lately, like get, getting better. Oh, well, I'm sure it's been getting better for a long time. Yeah, you know, might, might get better enough. It's all good. Yeah, fine. Okay, I'll, I'll quit looking at it. These guys have been at it for a long time. But like I said, it's all it's all good. And they've been getting better at it too. So, you know, like I said, they're 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 getting there. This is this is somebody deciding to auto box or not auto box automatically, which I think is entirely fair. I I I have a general rant against auto boxing because the performance impacts are so high that that I want you to ask for it. Yeah, it's fine. I know that gets into the, you know, type annotations strictly for performance. Allow me to not make a mistake while writing code that I intend to run fast on large, you know, on big data, for instance, and and blow out at me if it's going to, you know, do something that has sort of bad performance accidentally. And then I can ask special for it. Yeah, it's like uh, this auto vectorization things from the compiler. Yeah, it, it will trigger sometimes, right? But sometimes you really want it to trigger. And there's no way to actually fail if it doesn't. Same thing. Sorry. Auto what? So the auto, auto vectorization. Oh, auto so vectorization. You really, yes. yes. So you really want it to trigger, right? But yes. there's no way to actually enforce it. And in, in, yes. And so what you would like to say is I have a type annotation that says, if the compiler cannot promise me he will vectorize, it's a compile time error and I'll fail to compile and then I can go fix my code. That, that's what I'm looking for in that kind of, in, in the case of vectorization, same for actually for kind of for auto boxing. I'm all happy to auto box if the compiler can promise me that he'll actually just get rid of it and it's not actually auto boxing anymore. Um, and the semantics are all easy. I just throw my, my little ints into a, a hash table and he auto boxes under the hood and you know, the Java version auto boxes under the hood. And, and if he gets rid of that, or the cost is low enough, then I don't care. But if the cost gets high, and what is the cost? Well, if I have a billion things, the cost gets big. So there's definitely a time and a place where I would like to say, here is a semantically equivalent form. One is 10 times more expensive than the other. Promise me the fast version, or throw me a compile error, and I'll go fix my program such that the compiler can figure it out. Because a 10x slower on a thing that takes, you know, days is 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 a bug, and it's a death bug. I can't wait that long. So there's there's a version of that that you'd like to have. Da, 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 fine. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's a general problem. Vectorization falls in that camp. On in my opinion, auto boxing falls in that camp. There's a couple other things that fall into that camp where you must clean it out entirely, or else it's a compile time error. Or I would like it to be a compile time error. Okay, what else? Today's session's been very intense. I need some something casual here. Well, I'm good at casual writing. Oh, good. What are you doing? Um, I just uh, wrote a blog post about inline caching in bytecode interpreters. Well, throw, throw the link in the chat. Yeah, I will. Let me, let me put a link. Emacs always. <laughs> I figure that's a very casual topic. <laughs> well, I mean, that's about it at all. <laughs> oh, does it list my uh, does it list my username or something or my email address here? I'm sorry. Why why is there a Vimmer Emacs? Oh, I see. Casual Be conversation. because it's casual conversation. So my my username at work is Emacs, which is why I was wondering. See, there you go. The answer that's the answer already. <laughs> why well, use Vim? You can have any editor you want as long as you want black. Or your editor can be any color you want as long as you want black. Yeah. Inline caching. Ah, da, da, da. Background. Okay. What what is this about? So the idea was like there's all these you look for inline caching on the internet and everybody in the mother's like blah 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 blah. We add a list of JIT stubs and blah 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 blah. It's not really it. And I was like, okay, nobody has explained this in like a terse code sample. <laughs> well, I claim I've tried repeatedly on stage many, many times. Well, I haven't seen those talks then. Or maybe I just, I don't watch videos also because I can't, I, the scrubbing and blah, blah, blah. I like reading. 
Okay, fine. I so, actually read this earlier, I think last week. It was actually quite nice. <laughs> oh, I'm glad you liked it. Because I ran into the same problem where um, there's a lot of uh, you know papers on the subject and then a lot of, I would say, poorly summarized articles. Uh, and to me, one of the uh, sort of unanswered questions is, okay, well, you know, the concept of an inline cache itself is fairly straightforward. But how do you refer to that cache efficiently from the instruction? Mm-hmm. Uh, and then there's some article sort of hand waving, like, oh yeah, we just do you know dynamic recompilation, like okay. But no. you know, let's say you have a fixed size instruction, how would you somehow store the inline cache in that? For example? Yeah, I, I, I and I can go down really deep, really fast here because I've done this <laughs> a number of times, but only for Java. So this guy's you're doing it for like small talk and for properties versus methods. So you can carry on. Sorry, go ahead. I have a very no, strong, very strong. So the the sort of thought I always had is like, okay, you know, let's say your instruction has eight bytes of spare space. Well, what you can do is somehow slap the pointer to that cache in there, uh, and then read that. No, um, much more efficient than that. Right, but then I think okay, but then you still have the overhead of a pointer in direction, which probably is better than the full. That's what was the port itself, Zen. Yeah. You, you are correct. Right. Anamorphic was the startup doing the commercialized version of self. They got bought by Sun and we ported the runtime to do Java instead. Sorry, interrupt again. <laughs> no, so th- that's kind of where um, I think a lot of these articles um, sort of run dry, I think is the right word. Where yeah. you can sort of think, okay, the, you know, this might be an option that, but there isn't really something that clearly says this is how you do it. Like at least in a way that you know the average mortal understands it without having to dive into like 500 papers. Right. No, I can do this right here, right now, and I want to say I've done this talk, but I don't have it. Don't have it in the detail that you're asking for this group in a written thing. It's true. So you're at x86. You have variable length instructions. You have four bytes of spare thing you can do shit with. And you want to arrange that one of those four bytes refers to a class. And one of the four bytes refers to the target method you're going to directly call as the jitted target. So an inline cache for Java, not necessarily what here is going to be load, uh, 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 load, load a value, load compare against the four bytes that are your, your class target, jump if fail, you don't care where call one byte, target four bytes. So roughly speaking, there's a dozen bytes. You cannot patch across a cache line boundary, but you can patch half instructions. So, so, so now, yeah, it's getting weird quick here. So because you can't patch across a cache line boundary, the four byte pieces, the two four byte chunks cannot span a cache line boundary. And you have to have knots to make that not happen. Then you, your, your inline cache has five states and there's transitions and it's a state machine because multiple threads race to change the inline cache and multiple CPUs are executing the cache while it's being patched. And in any case, all possible combinations of instructions you load have to do something sensible. They can't just cause you to wail off and die. Okay, so the, the states are, I'm empty. Anyone who touches the cache on execution will take the fail path. We will discover it's empty and patch it. Usually you take a lock, so only one guy patches at a time. I am uh, uh, caching, pointing to uh, a valid target. I am caching, I, I, am, I am pointing to the generic, I don't know what the hell I'm doing, do it the hard way target. I am caching as a, as a interface method God damn it, I can't remember the, the last state. And the interface call has to have a different semantic, but it's the same collection of instructions. So the, the, the empty one's easy. The load instruction is left as, a, I don't care, I'm loading a value that's zeros. It has to be a valid load. And the jump 
uh, instruction after the compare. There's a compare, which again, doesn't care what it is. The jump is hardwired as always taken to go fix me. You patch it by taking the lock so no one else is patching with you. You edit the code in the decache. You have to force the decache flush. You have to force an iCache flush. Um, but you only force the iCache flush lazily by CPUs as they failed because they saw the prior decache version, the prior version they had. But you must force the decache or the iCache will never see it. And your own self CPU core will do it correctly. Other cores will continue to cache as the D and iCache are not coherent, will continue to see the old iCache indefinitely until they take an iCache flush. So, so there's another version that has to, that's probably my fifth state, when you want to do a code clean out. And it's really complicated to get rid of all opportunities for a late arriving CPU to see a stale inline cache call to a stale target. So you can't get rid of where the called method calls to for a very long time. But, but the end result is it's a load of an L1 hit kind well, of, your, of your object header which you have to have as a baked it down to a four byte or less class ID. So narrow object pointers for class headers. In the Azul case, we did class IDs as a, you know, 19, 20 bit thing. Um, and then you do a compare against a constant and then a jump not equal to a failout place um, and then a call. And you can arrange the jump not equal and the compare jump not equal on the other side of the call target if you'd like to do it that way, but then you have a different semantic. So at Azul, we did it as a load compare jump call and at Sun, it's load call to a pre-header piece, then it's a compare and jump to fail. And I like the Azul version better, it cleans a lot of weird corner cases out, but either way, route can be made to work. Um, but the, the other pieces are, you know, you have to align so you don't span a cache boundary you have to patch in order so that a racing CPU will get a valid prefix at any point, typically by making the jump always fail to the slow path until the other pieces are done and flushed out of your decache, but not into everyone else's iCache. And then you patch the jump uh, and then flush it out of your decache uh, and, and you can go away. I want to claim it might be it. I did this a couple times on a bunch of CPUs there's another weird business going on with, well, I talked about how to, how to, if you, if you fail, if you, if you fail the MP case, it's easy. You, you set a class ID and a target method in. If the target method changes, you can always update the call. So the target method is like jump to an interpreted version because I don't know nothing. That's fine. You have an interpreted stub that lets you run off the interpreter from a compiled code, but you jitted a copy. So you change it from the interpreter stub to the jitted copy. Then you re-jitted the copy and you re-re-re-jitted the copy. You keep changing the call every time and that's fine. Um, the class can't change because somebody can do a compare on the class ID and get swapped out by the OS till the heat death of the universe and then swap back in. And then they will take the jump according to, accordingly. And if you want to change the class that you're caching, He's already made the test the wrong way so that when he comes out, he'll pass the jump because he already thinks he got the jump correct and then he'll call the wrong method. So you cannot change the class ID without fully flushing the, the inline cache to empty, which typically requires a full safe point, stop all threads and make them all flush their iCaches. So you don't want to flush everyone's iCache, that's too expensive, except at a safe point it's valid. So the, the story on iCache flushing is you only do it at full safe points which means uh, 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 you can run it downhill from empty to the five states from empty to I'm caching one dude, whether it's a method or an interface or they're slightly different to I'm doing it the hard way, but I can't go from the hard way back to uh, a different target class I'm caching without flushing everyone's iCache, which typically means you must stop all threads because you don't have a way to ask the OS to flush all iCaches. Um, yeah, my, my head just exploded. <laughs> that, that's yeah, massive okay, info fine. overload. Uh, I, I have to drop off, but um, I have a bunch down. more questions related to this uh, that I'll ask next week. Yeah, the, the code that I, I redid it as Azul from scratch and got the code really tidy and neat. And the flip from Azul hardware to x86 hardware was therefore pretty straightforward. Um, I like that final version of it. And yes, it'd be somewhere has to be written up. 
Arthur, is there any chance the open source version of the Azul code is lying around? Do you know where it is? Uh, if there is one, I'm not aware of it. There had been one years ago, but I don't know. OK, fine. Yeah. Yeah. The reason I'm so focused on blog posts is because this live format of like you're pointing to five things on your fingers and I'm trying to keep the entire state of the thing in my head just does not work. <laughs> I get it. I get it. Well, usually we have a less detailed and intense conversation. Uh, this was something that I'm very proud of and I'm very happy. And, and it was surprising to see people say it was complicated. And then I said, well, I just did this. And, and then suddenly it became, you know, oh, yeah, OK, there's a lot of subtlety involved. And, and you're right, a blog post would be the right thing. And now that I think about it, I, I don't have a level of detail in an online conversation talk I've done that would work for this group. I, I'm usually hitting a, a broader audience. And I just point out it's a, you know, you have a key and a value in the cache and, and they're in the code directly. And that's about as far as it goes. The whole thing about, hey, you have five states and you can't switch from the last state to the first state without a full thing. And you have to have, boundaries around cash lines and stuff that doesn't come out in the quick easy quick easy version of things show and here's your this is your patching code cash at yeah it's a really stupid like this is no no concurrency there's no you just put it in the array and then the next time the loop comes around yeah I see here, let me roll backwards, make sure I'm reading the right thing. I have my, my key and my value in the code as part of the instructions, not as a side array. And that's part of the- It's literally in line. Literally in line. There's only yeah. one key. There's only one, uh, one value. I think so that's one of the exploring further notes at the end of the post. I wanted to do a separate thing because I didn't want to like, blah, 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 you know, this, we have this instruction format, but also we, you know, if we decide to optimize this function, we expand the opcode size to have inline caches. And, but um, no, it's, it's, yeah, it's one of the exploring further bullet points. And I, I would like to explore that further. So that's the code. Okay, so this is not, this is for Azul hardware. No, I'm no. using generic instructions. This right. is identical for x86, just change the encodings around. It's, it's certainly not for Azul hardware. Azul are custom met instructions for this. The Azul hardware is two instructions long because the load compare jump not equals one instruction. Uh, what is class con? It's your class, however you want to define a class. I want to know. R1 or R0 is the last class that came around, same class, different object, okay, same okay. class. So yeah, in a 32-bit yeah. JVM, it's your class pointer as a, as a GCable pointer for the class object. It's the VM's internal class object. For a 64-bit VM that's using narrow pointers, it's a 32-bit narrowed pointer. For a 64-bit like also... VM, you have to have an issue there to do something with that. So for and things like um, add with two ints, I think this would be, it would be fun to write up like, okay, well, we specialize add int and then instead of uh, uh, writing a call for method target, we just inline add them. I'm not sorry what you mean by inlines. So if you have like, you know, I say we have rewrite add to add int and you do a, you do a class comparison, you know, you know, maybe you have tag pointers, you know that the two arguments are ints, uh, like small integers. Um, really quickly. You're and trying then, to do the inline cache variation of a tagged integer add that didn't overflow. Is that what I'm hearing? Yes. Okay. And then oh, no. no that, the this, this is the case where the compiler has bailed out because he doesn't have any clue about what you're doing. Oh, got it. If you have profiling data and you have a hot case, he'll just put the code in the compiler that says, load the class and compare and if you're the right class i'm now inlining the the fast version right here now and then the slow version might do this or might just dump off to the interpreter or whatever yeah you, you can view this profile guide to visualization and inlining like a variation of inline cache call 
because yeah. you cache your method in the compiled code, and if the cache doesn't match, you recompile. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Or the compiler emits the slow version off to the side or whatever. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The inline cache is a is a wad of code that's blindly inserted to implement a virtual call where the compiler is given up. Okay, silly question. Um, say you have some method in Java. You also have, you know, for like a standard library thing, but you also have um, for certain types uh, like a C++ implementation, and maybe you even have like a small assembly stub mm -hmm. um, that you can inline. How do you keep track of all of the like three different three or four implementations of this thing across multiple different languages and like without okay. losing? Yeah, stuff. right. So at the high, at the Java case, the high level semantic, there is a, a, a generally a collection of bytecodes and which not for natives. And there's a pile of jitted code targets of which there may be multiple jitted code targets. Um, typically there's a hot, there's, a, new, there's a, a one that is the current correct one. And there's a bunch of stale ones that are allowed to continue execution, but you can't get rid of yet for whatever lifetime reason you're managing. But there's always a, a most bestest version. One of the versions you can have is a stub that just jumps to the interpreter. So it takes your arguments from the jitted API call and shuffles them into the interpreter's favorite version and jumps off to the interpreter. So you'll have in the in the VM's runtime implementation for a method, you'll have a bunch of versions of this. You can generate the interpreter one on the fly. You'll have one hot target method that's the goal one. You'll have several stale copies that can live around for a while yet you haven't got rid of. Um, is that, and, and if you have a native call, then you have, it's like you have a, a, a jitted interpreted version. You have a just a wad of machine code you're going to go jump to that came from some other mean, place. In this case, it came from somebody's assembly that they wrote. From like a develop, not like a not like a runtime state perspective. From a development, I'm a developer perspective. You have all these different representations of the same code, sometimes yeah. for different preconditions. How do you, as a developer, maintain some coherent view of this thing? Uh, as far as I'm concerned, a Java method has a lot of properties. One of them is there is one hot target, and there's a bunch of stale ones I'm doing lifetime okay. management on the code for. So a method has one main target I'm going to jump to to go execute. Is that, when you say developer, I'm thinking I am a JVM developer. I am yes. busy debugging my JVM. I go to a method, I list what it has. It has a, a current hot method. It has some stale methods. This is just properties. This is a struct, it's a C++ struct. And I have a list in the struct, an array of methods. There's the hot one. There's other properties about the method happen all the time, whatever. There's the bytecode pile that has bytecodes, you know, its name, its rank and serial number, whatever other shit you need in there. That... I mean, I'm, lo I'm looking at uh, like, I'm trying to find it again, but the template interpreter, for example, um, you have some x86 variant that I can no longer find. I've completely lost it. Yeah. But it's got uh, a interpreter. Yeah. Of... I looked at it not even that long ago. I yeah. had the source code lying around somewhere. But like whatever. What about like... the template interpreter? So you've got a template interpreter, which has a bunch of assembly uh, uh, implementations of the. Um, I don't know. I don't even remember if there's a C interpreter or if you just skip that step entirely. There's no C++ interpreter. So we okay. skip that entirely. There's just the template interpreter. I'm, I'm looking at the code for the template interpreter now. Yes. Okay. I am at, uh, oh, I'm actually in the, the, the source CPU VM x86 version. Oh, the share. Source. No, no, the share version is fine. The share is the, is the structure that all flavors take. And then there's the, uh, um, there's the, uh, there's the machine specific version, right? Or share the um, interpreter. Yeah, fine. Yeah, I'm looking at the, the shared version now. So the shared version has no machine code, right? It just has the high level overview of things. And here's template interpreter about CPP. What are you trying to figure out? Okay, so I, I didn't realize that there was no C++ interpreter. Um, I was thinking, well, if you have a C++ interpreter and you have a template interpreter with a bunch of different machine code, yeah. And then also you have 
a JIT, yeah. or like an IR, multiple different IRs, like yeah. keeping them all. The, the method structure has a bunch of target methods, that target code that you're going to jump to. One of them will methods. be the entry point to the template interpreter for that method. So, okay, so, so, so this gets into a little more complicated things here. So, so the, the end goal of this complication is highest possible speed jitted code calling jitted code. So that inline cache is for jitted code calling jitted code. It has the sort of the minimal overhead. If you don't have an inline cache, you're just doing a static call. You have an API, which is your favorite API that you define when you define the JVM for that target. It's not necessarily like var args enabled C++ because you don't have any var args in Java. So you have an API for the best possible API for jitted code calling jitted code. Now rolling it backwards, you want to have an interpreter too. So the API for jitted code has a bunch of things in registers and the interpreter has everything on the stack. So you have a stub that translates the API call for jitted code to the interpreter's version. And the entry point here that goes, that takes you from like this call of inline cache to target method that happens to be only implemented in the interpreter, that method target will be the stub entry, which shuffles the args to the interpreter state and then jumps to the interpreter entry point, which will then begin executing, you know, at the interpreter level. As part of the stub, he'll load the bytecode pointer because the interpreter needs the bytecode pointer. And he'll get that because he jumps to the target for the method, which has a generic signature shuffle args, has a specific for this particular method of here is the method constant as a C++ object. And from the method constant, I can get the method bytecode pointer, which the interpreter needs. So there's a bunch of setup stuff that got complicated at the transitions between jitted code and interpreted code in order to support the notion that JIT calling JIT is the fastest it can be. Do you have a, a reference file or name or something I can look up for it? You're, you're talking about the, the method struct that... Methods has... would be, yeah, it'd be in the VM code. So source share VM. Oh, probably under oops here. Yeah, look under oops. And there method oop dot HPP method class method data class. It took me a while to realize that uh, oop does not mean object oriented programming in this case. It does. No, well, not programming. Object ordinary object, object pointer. pointer. Yes. Yeah, but it, I was. Well, like, I would have said object oriented pointer. Ordinary object pointer. Yeah, P is for pointer. Oh. So I'm in. I'm in. Um, Source hotspot share. Uh, uh, you know, like that. I'm in JDK seven. You know, source share VM oops. Source share, VM oops. Method oop. And this this guy has its. You know, look at the the layout. Oh, the ASCII gram layout at the head of the doc has header in a class because it looks like a Java object, but it's a C++ object. It has a bunch of constant data like the, the reflective version and a bunch of constants for the method. Um, interpreter invocation count, that's your profiling. Vtable index, that's how the Vtable gets built for the Java Vtable. Um, method size, max local, size parameters, max stack, that's all summary data about the bytecodes so that the interpreter can make the proper size things go happen there. Intrinsic ID flags throughout count. That's all profiling data for fail points. Is this uh, method data oop? Method oop dot HPP. All right, I'm not seeing this file in JDK. I'm in JDK 7U dash hotspot. And I oh, so I'm this. in source share VM oops, right? I've got to put it in my, that's a yeah. in cat. In this the, is what I've got. Yeah, oop comes from self. That's correct. Source share VM oops. You don't have. Oh, yeah. you know what? I totally see. I do have it. I am blind. Fine. Yeah, but I, I can see it. <laughs> okay, so HPP, blah, blah, blah. Yeah. Uh, okay. And I'm just working down, you know, what are the contents of a method oop? And somewhere near the bottom of that ASCII gram, there's. A code pointer, that's your favorite loving code pointer that you're currently in love with. 
eye to eye is going to be how the interpreter views the, the interpreter in hotspot has um, has been unrolled uh, five way according to whether the value of the top of stack is an int, a float, a oop, a long, or a double, or void, or something like that. It's been maybe unrolled six times. So there, there's an eye to eye version to get a more efficient interpreter. The adapter pointer near the bottom there, that is the, I went from compiled code to the interpreter, uh, or I went from an interpreter entry to compiled. And then there's a from compiled and from interpreter as other parts of the same thing. So the adapter is how I shuffle args. And then there's a stub, which is just load in the method constant point, the pointer to the bytecodes uh, directly. Um, and then shuffle arcs or shuffle arcs and load the, I think it's shuffle, uh, depending on which way you're going, it's shuffle arcs and load the right kind of pointer uh, for the interpreter state. Or so what is this thing that says C++ interpreter only if there's no C++ interpreter? Um, there was a version of a C++ interpreter. So the, the code's been oh. around the block a long time. In the That's very, cool. very early days, there was a C++ interpreter. It got evicted and then resurrected and killed several times. As far as I know, it's not currently active, um, and no one, you know, no one cares or uses it. So that's sort of dead. Except that Grawl may have resurrected it and said we have a C plus plus or we have a Grawl version of the interpreter or something like that. So if def cc interp, so you look further down on whatever that line around, around line one twenty, there's a if def cc interp. Those float around, but as far as I know, like I said, no one's using that. It hasn't used it in a long time. A long time. I do a grep, it only shows up here and in method class um, and no one else is using it in this, in this directory. I'm gonna do a, a larger grep here, um, but I probably won't see anything unless I go to the assembly side. Oh, I got a little bit in the generator. Yeah, there, there, there are some hooks floating around for it, but I don't claim it's been used in 20 years. Somebody may have it, but I, I never used it in all my years. I'm sure this all predates me anyway. Well, right. I'm, I'm claiming the C++ interpreter kind of predated me, and I kind of came in at the ground floor. Like, from the land of self, there's probably a C++ interpreter that came ported over by default and then quickly got dropped for the generated interpreter. So the hotspot interpreter is uh, generated at the start of the VM. When you kick a VM up, he emits assembly at a high-level assembler in, written in C into a buffer. And that's your interpreter. So you get a hand machine generated interpreter generated at the start of the VM, at the boot of the VM. So it lets you have a few extra fun hooks with the VM has intrinsic deep knowledge of the interpreter and vice versa. But there's no C++ interpreter. Not so for platforms that you haven't brought up uh, an assembly interpreter or template there, interpreter before. There is an assembler. So the template interpreter is the assembly interpreter. The template interpreter generator and the template interpreter are are the things here. I don't know what's the right way to go. Um, I can go bring the code up. Uh, helps you. Has uh, a, a list of bytecodes, and he knows the flavor of every bytecode. If it do what it does to the stack, it takes two items or one item, produces one or two, and the type of the thing at the top of the stack taken and returned, and then he generates. Uh, for every bytecode, an entry point into an interpreter table that you're going to jump from one to the next to the next off with shortcuts taken if the you know top of stack is of the correct flavor for the right thing. Um, and then the, the high level generate the interpreter bits boil down into you know the machine specific version, which you know the high level version is like move a thing from the top of stack into the top of stack chosen register. Do the machine code for the register, which is like an add or a load. Move the thing back to the top of stack in the top of stack way, which if I know I'm loading a value that's an int and I'm in the version of the interpreter that targets an int top of stack, I don't change which version and so on and so forth. So there's there's a game played with stitching five flavors of the interpreter cross compiling back and forth to each other. So the interpreter can skip a few extra instructions at every dispatch. Like, the performance of, of, of every of a C of a standard C C++ interpreter, call that performance X. You use GNU label bars to do the jumps, 
you can get 2x. You do a, a hard rolled one. This is the computed go to thing. I'm sorry? This is the computed go to trick? Yeah, yeah. You do a hard rolled interpreter, a hand rolled single copy interpreter, you get another 2x over the computed go to. You do a version of the interpreter where the top of stack is cached and register and is tight. So you have different types, you have different versions of the interpreter for the different types of the top of stack. You get another 20, 30% out. Hold on, you're saying you generate you different generate, interpreters? Generate the interpreter at the start of the VM. But but for different, how, how many copy, copies generate, do you have if you generate for different types of the stack? Five copy or six. Wow. It's the interpreters notion of types. So the interpreter only has, the Java bytecode interpreter only has a notion of the, the, the stack is typed as an int, a float, a long, a double, a pointer. That's the only things it understands. So pointer has no further deep knowledge from the interpreter's point of view. So you have bytecodes that load a pointer, that store a pointer from the top of stack, and you're strongly typed at that level. With no further, you know, you store float and you load it, float, and you know, store an int, and you load an int, and long double, blah, blah, blah. So we make five copies of the interpreter. There might be a sixth copy where you don't cache the top of stack, um, which is used on the as you first come in and various back edges of loops and stuff that shows up. So maybe there's six copies of the interpreter, there's five or six copies, something like that. So if you have some like math heavy function, it's just doing a bunch of integer math, you switch to a different interpreter that specializes. It, 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 we switch interpreters bytecode by bytecode. Oh shit! Okay, that's if if a and, and it's woven in. So if you're running a load int and you're in a version of the interpreter where the top of stack was a pointer and the and the load says take the pointer from the top of stack, it's in a register now. The code for the load is take this register and load through it at whatever offset to get an int value which is going into the same register because that's the top of stack. Now jump to the dispatched logic version of the interpreter, which knows the top of stack is an integer. Is that a matter of switching the dispatch tables or is there some extra piece of state that you have to, to switch when you make that interpreter it's transition? A matter of, you, it's a matter of switching the ditch, dispatch tables, except that my recollection is the dispatch tables are only uh, uh, switched uh, uh, semantically, that the actual switch is I jumped the program counter to another pile of code, which is the version where I'm in the other table. And then okay. I can tell what table I'm in because I have five copies and I do a range check. If I need to know what table I'm in, I have five copies and know I do a range check. This would be another fun thing for a blog post because hearing about it, I'm like, uh, <laughs> I need, I need, Pretty pictures or, or like a hundred lines of code. Right, right. Not a hundred thousand lines of code. I mean, maybe if I have a PhD, you know, worth of study. No, there's no PhD here. This is all like assembly crap. It's like, uh, I'd like to say it's not rocket science, but it's very detail oriented. Yeah, but if because you throw a hundred thousand lines of code at me, it's going to take me a couple of years. Yeah, right, right. It, it, and I'm, I'm kind of being facetious. It's not that big, but it's not small. So if I go look at template interpreter.cpp, let me, let me, I mean, it's the same directory as everything else here. Let me just pull this thing up here. It's a, it's a good, stupid thing here. Um, this is the interpreter. And what's my template interpreter yet? Yeah, yeah. Okay, so I'm here. I'm on it around line 500. Template interpret generator, generate and dispatch. Uh, template interpreter.cpp. Oh, you're in the JDK one. Yeah. So, oh, wait, 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 you get there. So I'm looking at code that, that, that does like, Starts so what with this. Okay, generated dispatch. And the 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 toss state is top of stack state. That Got says it. my top of stack is int, float, double, long pointer. Then there's a whole lot of if codes in seek that generate crap. This, this follows. Codes. Those generate debugging things in the interpreter. 
without, if you don't have any debugging going on in the interpreter, then these generate nothing. So this is, I'm about to generate a bytecode, right? And then there's, uh, you know, a, 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 a widget for generating dispatch, which is too complicated, but it's not really. And it has things like if if my top of stack is matching, if it's legal, if it's illegal, if it's, you know, if I'm adding verification. Oh, dispatch prolog. Okay, dispatch is broken up in a prolog and an epilogue, but it's dispatch prolog. Then you get generate template. Well, that's the bytecode in question. Load, load a byte, uh, load a pointer, load an int, load a double, store a double, call the square root that's in pop, dupe, swap, all of, that's you're generating the, the, the bytecode for that. And then there's some other stuff, uh, another if def, just checking kind of thing. And then there's a, you know, epilogue. And the generate prologue and dispatch epilogue are things like take the bytecode pointer, grab the bytecode and jump to the correct place. Um, and and advance the bytecode pointer and do some other checks like yeah, it's a back edge. I have to bump the interpreter's counter so I can count to back edges. And if the back edge exceeds 10,000, call the JIT. But the prologue and epilogue don't do the guts of the bytecode per se. They do the dispatch logic. So it's complicated for being broken out into lots and lots of very fine grained parts so that you can There's optimize nothing. each of the parts independently. There's no code in the dispatch prologue as far as I can tell for for x86 um it has varied over the years so we'd have to go look at the dispatch prologue and I'd have to look at that yeah for sure no, it says for the 32 bit it says nothing Intel specific and for the 64 bit it says nothing AMD 64 specific um well, that could be look at dispatch epilogue here I haven't oh, looked right here epilogue dispatch, oh, dispatch next Okay, load next byte code. Well, this is neat. But what file are you in here? I'm in, I'll send it to you, interpmasm64. Interpmasm64? Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay. Yeah. Dispatch this is cool. Prologue. Nothing. Yeah, that's, that, that could be reasonable. Dispatch next for the epilogue. And what is dispatch next? Dispatch next. So R13 is the uh, PC so, or something? This says there's no prologue, and the epilogue looks like this. Which is dispatch next, which is load next bytecode, which is yeah. grab a bytecode from the bytecode pointer, increment, and then dispatch on the bytecode, which is you know jump register contents of table, where the table What's comes EGI? from the state. So, so imagine it's the, not gross income. I'm sorry. What's AGI? Um, it's not gross. No, it's not adjusted gross income. I would have to go. It's probably have to do the interpreter. Somebody's done, done some. Oh no, it's a very old, old term related to x86 performance. It, I would claim just ignore it. It's um, okay. Pentium Pro era performance hack, where you would have a collision of a fixed count of functional units between a load instruction and an increment targeting the, ba the, uh, the base of the register you're loading from. And he would add a clock cycle because you had a collision between the right back of the increment and the, the load, if you did them in the wrong order. So this happens a bunch of the times. There's very old versions of optimizations for the generations of things less exciting on many other platforms. And these days, of course, for a very long time, it didn't matter what order you increment and what order you load, it's still two instructions. And it doesn't matter what order you do it. So that comment is old. And the ordering between those two is not required to be that order anymore for performance. But it doesn't help either. So it just gets ignored. So you have, this is the template interpreter. Do a lot of these, um... There's a lot of switching of contexts and stuff that does this all get elided when you have a JIT? Uh, yeah, yeah. The, the JIT doesn't the JIT doesn't care about the interpreter. And the interpreter doesn't care about the JIT. So when you say elided, you're running bytecodes in the interpreter. When you jump to the JIT, the JIT never uses any of the interpreter code. It has its own thing. Does that answer your question? Yeah. So, so I guess this is coming back to my earlier question of like, you have all of this code, you have a bunch of duplicate implementations of something. How do you keep them all? 
Okay. So the like, interpreter is its own standalone thing, has nothing to do with any method. Every method has a short piece of code stub that jumps to this degenerated interpreter here. That's one of the targets. If I go back to method oop, HPP, and I go look at my, my set of pointers that are floating around, one of them is, and here is how I jump to the interpreter. And here is how I jump uh, to some compiled code. And I have a list of things. Separately, there's uh, uh, you know, a set of extra pieces of code that are that are timing out for being old for stale. They're not actually stored. I don't see them stored with the method. I don't think they would be, um, but they have to be kept track of elsewhere. So method is a collection of, you know, a bunch of pointers and a bunch of data bits. One of them is here's the hot target I'm jumping to. And one of them is here's my, how I handle going to the interpreter. There's only a couple choices there. Right. Is that making sense now? I feel like I'm not asking this question well. Um, I'm missing. How do you avoid diverging implementations of like, so for behavior differences, like you accidentally, you know, you have multiple copies of. Multiple copies of what? See the interpreter just does bytecode by bytecode. The jitted code had better do the semantics of a pile of byte codes taken all at the same time. Maybe it would help to look at the JIT. Do you have a, do you have a uh, oh, the JIT's um, even bigger. <laughs> all right. Never mind. But we have the hotspot overview to talk about the JIT. So now you're asking how does a compiler preserve semantics? That's a that's a standard compiler question. It's a standard good old as if rule. If you can't tell from a language point of view, you can't tell. So the, the semantics are the same between the jitted and the interpreted, but semantics do not include time. So the jitted version is typically, you know, 10 times faster. Outside of time, there are identical semantics. Oh, time changes races. Well, you got data races. Part of your semantics is you got data races. That's still the same valid semantics. The, the clock cycle by clock cycle behavior will change. I don't know if that's what you mean by diverging semantics. There's no divergence beyond that. No, I mean like I mean like one idiot just go like me going in and changing, you know, something in the interpreter, and then not changing it in the JIT. Um. So so in the case of Java bytecodes, the semantics are well defined. So you can't change anything in the interpreter um, that changes semantics. If you change the interpreter's execution behavior because you have a cool new way to make it run faster, that's all great. But that didn't change any semantics. And the jitted code then didn't change either. So it's all good. And if you did, it was the bug. I'm sorry? And if you did change the behavior, it yeah. was probably a bug. It was a bug. Yeah, exactly. Right. So suppose that you're defining new bytecodes for your new favorite language. If you make a semantic change in the bytecodes, you start from the semantics, not from the interpreter's behavior. You start from semantics. Then you make the interpreter match the semantics. You make the JIT match the semantics. And you can change the semantics all you want. And therefore, you can change the interpreter. Then you match the JIT to match the semantics. For Java, the sense. semantics are nailed in stone for 20 years. I guess, yeah, I was thinking about this in context of a language that has like a fixed release cadence and, you know, people will just make changes all day long, but Java's not changed that much. The, the underlying semantics of the execution engine are not changing. The last major change was like the Java memory model. Like even the Valhalla stuff doesn't really change the semantics. You know, the inlining objects and raw to access this and that those aren't really changing in the semantics they're all about performance and in various interesting use cases that's different that, that may have said i took this thing and i made it go faster or i made it take less memory because i inlined the objects or whatever oh, there's there's also some subtlety that uh, compilers can refine the semantics and choose 
some particular behavior out of the set of possible behaviors. Mm -hmm. So you can observe different behavior from the interpreter and compiler, but they should be like, but you have a set of behaviors which are allowed by yep. your language spec. Yep. And compiler and interpreter may choose different behaviors, but they are all part of the, of the language spec. They're all within the semantic range, yes, but they yep. can be different. This happens all the time when you choose to run on different chips and you're looking at multi-threaded behavior between say an x86 and an ARM. You got a four core ARM on your phone, you got an eight core x86 on your desk. They have very different memory models. Within the language spec, it's easy to write programs that can detect AMD versus x86 based on their behavior, but it's still within the semantics of the spec. And the practical aspects of this is it's a whole lot of discipline on the developer's part to be doing code review and monitoring things and running massive numbers of tests, right? Yeah, to manage the semantic changes, to manage changes that are intended to be semantic change free. Yeah, you have to test. And, and yeah, it's discipline. Yeah. Your every language implementation on the planet starts with I have a, you know, I have a halting problem, open box, anything goes, and I'm restraining you to some semantics that I want the language to be. And that's, that's all about discipline. You, you over and over and over again have to think of what I'm writing in this language, which has nothing to do with that language and how it implements that language. So what are the semantic carryover? What can I guarantee myself from this language? Like Hotspot's big C++ program, we had to go do concurrency at a time when there was no concurrency in C++. There was a volatile keyword. It didn't do doodly squat. Um, you know, it, it prevented the heart, the compiler from emitting or, or optimizing away loads and stores. The hardware effectively optimized them away. The compiler could reorder a lot of things anyhow. So, no Java memory model semantics were achievable with C++ volatile keywords. So if you wanted to have any sort of interesting semantic within the core guts of the JVM, even outside of Java, the semantic of the volatile keyword is not helpful, didn't do anything. So we have huge piles of macros that forced uh, uh, memory barriers for every different platform and every different kind of thing, every different kind of memory barrier you wanted because we were making an ordering guarantee across threads in C++ code that wasn't there before. And we had to do it you know, basically by scratch and by discipline. We'll go look up uses of mem bars. Probably not gonna be here. It'll be the actual implementation of them. Like, like in x86 land, some of the memory barriers are no ops because he's just that ordering. And if you're a Spark or an AMD, the same memory barrier emits something for real. Where's a good instance of that? Oh God, lib ADT is still in here. That's so sad. And ADLC, oh my God. Um, oh, almost surely, I'm probably spelling it wrong. Oh, here we go. Order access that HPP is one of them. Let's see here. Order access. No, oh, God, I don't want to do that one. I'm grabbing the wrong thing. It's okay. Yeah. Yes. In, implements memory order in C++. Yes. Yes, exactly. Discipline on complicated things. There you go. <laughs> Use membars. Yes. Oh, here you go. That's a good question. Wow, I mistyped it. That's fine. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, x86, oh yeah, and, and Intel. Yeah, x86 didn't have a real membar, a real memory model defined for a very long time. Their history there was they produced chips and other people produced motherboards and two chip four chip motherboards had memory ordering according to what the motherboard vendor had the chips communicate as. Um, so a compact 
dual CPU motherboard and a Dell dual CPU motherboard had different memory semantics. Eventually, Intel started doing the chip to chip communication chips as well. And then they could define the memory order, but they didn't want to deny their co motherboard generators for a long time. And finally, it came around that Intel was the only guy actually doing multi chip systems. And so you always got your memory ordering from Intel. And then they would, they finally came out and said, okay, we have a memory ordering. And then they were wrong. Um, and then people proved them wrong and they went back and they fixed it. And, and, you know, these days you've got a memory ordering that's pretty reasonably understood on x86. Um, but that was a deck hotspot was out a decade before we had a memory ordering from Intel. Um, yep. Good stuff. And then AMD went through several go rounds of memory ordering too. They had some initial version, which they both lied about. When I say lie, it's a little crude. They, they, they were incorrect as to what it actually was. And also it was not usable for anybody. Um, and then they, they redefined it several go rounds before they got it locked down to something you could work with. <coughs> All right. All our heads all full now. Is it time to be done? I hear it's quiet. It's been two hours. Oh my God. Okay, somebody got me excited. I talked too long. Fine. So, like, I should do a write up on inline caches in my spare time there. That'd be great. Cool stuff there. Sorry, go ahead. That would be great. I'd love to read it and maybe write a smaller compact digest. Uh, yeah, right. Well, it wouldn't have to be huge, but there's a lot of parts to it. That's fine. Okay. Well, I, I'm going to call it quits. Everyone's got quiet except me. So that's not a conversation. That's a lecture. Um, until we meet again next week. Great. Bye-bye. Yeah. Bye everyone.